Hello class, welcome to week six of Discipleship in the Local Church. This week our theme, our focus is environments of discipleship, outward and inward effects. Your reading assignment, if you haven't already began, is Blevins and Maddox chapters 15 and 16, and then Gauss chapter 10 and 11. As I have the last few weeks, I'm going to spend the majority of my time with Maddox and Blevins as the extreme practical side of this. This is one of those discussions, again, that I would love to have with you. It is something personally for me that is, uh, I think, a very important discussion in the modern church, specific in the Church of God of Prophecy, as we evaluate things. Let me uh, jump very briefly into Gauss as he specifically deals with the outward manifestation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the inward effects, again, chapters 10 and 11. Uh, these are great chapters, and uh, please read them. Please engage in them in your study and, and in your writing. They will be important uh, for you, and, and they're great materials uh, for you to view and, and uh, to remember, and it will add to your methods of discipleship. But for time, because we are very limited in our time together, I'm going to focus, as I said, into Blevins 15 and 6, Blevins and Maddox chapters 15 and 16. Chapter 15 deals in the learning environments as this kind of section of the book really opens up. And uh, they really look at the very physical uh, space that is designed around discipleship and why it's important. Uh, for many of us, we inherited churches or we were um, just called into the church that we're serving. And so in many respects, we say to ourselves, the space is the space, uh, or maybe it is what it is, and we can only do what we can do with it. And I understand that that we can only do the things that we have been given, but there are some very um, well-formed questions with the strong basis of why you should evaluate several things in your local church in the spaces that you use, um, and I encourage you to do so um, as you look through things. Now, one of the things I will specifically note, uh, of course, there is literally amounts of space, and, and depending on the uh, method uh, and the age that you are teaching or, or ministering to in that period, what those uh, space, literally square footage needs per person. But there's a, a fairly lengthy section on uh, really safety or security around your church. And I would just make a note of caution. In today's world, like never before, security is a vital element of your leadership into your local church, specifically for those of you in pastoral level uh, leadership. You need to make sure somewhere, somehow in your uh, facilities, you have some security measures in place. This is something many of us are continuing to evolve um, as our understanding grows and also the culture of our church. But uh, if you do not have some method of securitization in your church policy and some leadership serving there, I encourage you to take a look at these areas. There's a great conversation starters uh, in that. Now, uh, also in that specifically, I want to mention as there's a section that talks for children and youth as a primary issue, I think uh, page 222 speaks of this um, as an important area. General principles, it says, need to be in place to assist child screening and reporting guidelines. Um, I want to say that um, the Church of God of Prophecy has a child protection policy. If you're not aware of it, particularly, again, if you're a pastor or a children's or youth leader, you need to uh, go download that. I'll try to include the link uh, for you and maybe even the resource if we can find a way to post it. But this was passed through the International Assembly, and it is policy for every local church. It's not a question um, if you do or if you can use it. It is policy for every local church, uh, and it covers a variety of areas. And what this should do for you is these are specific areas that have been addressed for securitization, for safety for the children in the building and the wor workers and volunteers serving in your ministry. Um, and so it gives you already a policy that you just begin to implement. Um, so I, that's a great place to start. And for many of us that maybe have read that years ago, it is good to reread that, re-review your, your building, get a team together, uh, depending on your local church leadership structure, and go through that policy and see where you're at and living that out. Um, and 
things of background checks and how doors are kept in children's and youth facilities or spaces are important. And then again, the book that we are reading gives you some specific areas and notes to look at as well. But wanted you to uh, look at that. Beyond the safety and security, uh, there's some time and some space given about uh, the having a space that is friendly, um, that is learner friendly, and what that means. So uh, again. Um, I appreciate the willingness of so many of our people that I have had opportunity to serve with and so many of you that I, I sense just from speaking with you through um, our class. You, you use the resources God has placed in your hands, and that is wonderful. But I encourage you as we do that, also ask the Lord as good stewards, how do we make this space whether we have a classroom or uh, multiple classrooms, how do we make those spaces better? And if we can't make those better, are there alternative spaces, uh, things of homes and community uh, places are mentioned? We, we can look at the church beyond the building. And so take a moment and really look into your church. Again, we're the, the heart of this entire class is practical ministry. What do you do immediately as you do this class, and what do you review into your local church, and then what can you begin to practice in your church? So one of those places is specifically looking at your ages, looking into your space physically on campus, and then looking into your community and asking how you can do all of the above better. Um, and so uh, look through that chapter and look through your place and really take some time. There is, on page 225, there is, um, uh, it's called figure 15.2, this is a way to look into each room, make notes, and then um, cover a couple categories to give you kind of a walkthrough checklist as you review with yourself and your team each of your spaces and how they're being used. Um, I mentioned alternative spaces. Uh, 226 gives you some of those um, places and some things that you can do and what you would want to look for in those alternative spaces. Um, as you move into two, page 227, um, there's a section entitled relational spaces or relational space as alternative locations um, to be used. But, but the heart of this, again, is the relational dynamic of that. And, and so there's, again, a checklist for you. And really all of these spaces, in my personal opinion, is spaces that should have a relational component. Um, and that's a heart of what we're trying to do. Um, a few minutes I want to spend on a section in page 228 titled Facilitating Relationships with and Beyond Community, uh, car carrying into the next few pages. Um, this statement is read at, or given at the bottom of 228. It says, when people sing together, laugh and cry together, pray together, and even suffer through conflict together, they go pre grow pretty comfortable with one another. Um, I think it's a powerful statement. Um, we would simplify that in my church world and in our leadership is when people do life together. Uh, the key word is together, the ups and the downs. And um, we are beginning to move into something for me personally is, is an important part of discipleship as we begin to look at these relationships. And this section begins to talk about the element of community and what that means. Um, I love in the starting page of two or starting part of 229 how there are um, these four phases. It just classifies it as small group experts chart at least four phases of transition in community development. I won't take time to go in depth, but notice as you look at that how there is a tentative uh, community that this beginning place really is what we're speaking of, um, and this starting place that all groups or communities begin with. And then it moves into, um, notice the next one, a storming community is the next phase. Um, and, and it tells us as leaders, wherever we're at or the leaders we're leading, that we must exercise patience during this phase um, because these personal uh, allegiances can form. Uh, we can see a lot of negative in this storming phase, but yet it is important that this conflict and contention that arises, whether it is on the surface or, or below the surface, this confrontation is actually a part of development. So I encourage you um, with that. Many of the groups that we've led or that we've seen in our church, we see some form of conflict or confrontation come. 
Now, it doesn't mention it, but I use the phrase above surface or below. As a leader, you can often sense that below the surface, there's some confrontation. There's some conflict rising up. You can even watch it in body language sometimes with those that you're leading. This is normal and natural part of development. And so um, as you lead or as you train leaders, um, about how to do groups of some capacity or to build communities. This is an important part for them to be aware of, to expect some form of this to occur and to have patience through that. Uh, the last part of that section, or speaking of storming communities, it says often this is the most difficult phase for obvious reasons, and some groups disband during the storming phase because of the church's discomfort with conflict. And boy, um, I, I'm not sure about you, but so many areas that I have served in leadership, we are extremely um, uncomfortable and um, in moments of conflict. And to some degree, understandably, because again, we're to be united, we're to have the heart of Christ, and, and we don't see confrontation emerging. But if you really look to the life of Jesus, the disciples, even the disciples with each other, there were moments of conflict. There were moments of confrontation, even them arguing who is the greatest, right? Right. And Jesus took that as an opportunity to actually teach them and grow them. And through it, I believe they became more closely aligned and it was even a part of their development. And so um, train your leaders and be encouraged that confrontation is normal. It's a matter of how we lead through it that's important. Uh, after that, the third phase that they speak of is this level of norming, uh, norming communities where, where there becomes um, these minds and hearts over the group's identity. So the group identity kind of emerges from this period. Um, it says that Christian educators often focus on the vision of community, reminding people of a specific gifts or graces each to uh, each possess to accomplish their shared goals. So beyond the confrontation, beyond um, those periods, um, the, the educator or the leader is able to bring them back around the common purpose. Lastly, um, is the performing community. At this phase, the group is in sync as they work together, and this is where we really want to be. Um, I encourage you to continue. Now, at the bottom of 229, uh, there are several sentences and, and really a couple paragraphs moving to page 230 about uh, the tendency that small groups or communities can become what we would use in the book calls clicks um, instead of community. And, and this is such a difficult thing in, in groups or communities or even churches. I have served in some churches and, and uh, people would use negatively that, quote, there are clicks, there are groups, and we've got to break them up. And sometimes what I found in personal, again, experience is that they're really not clicks, but they're a, pe a group of people that have some common interests and they just do life together. And so this, uh, these paragraphs, again, bottom 220, two, uh, 229, rather, and page 230, talks about the difference of true, authentic community and cliques. And really the distinguishing mark by the definitions and, and the writing of the authors is that when a group becomes closed, not so much because it's closed in identity, but when they're unwelcoming of new people. So um, if there is a common interest in that group, whether it's organic in the sense of just people in your local church have become friends and they begin to engage in group gatherings, or whether it's a structured event or group that you have set aside as a leader, is the distinguishing mark of really an open community as the love of Christ and one that is a clique is one that is not open to allowing people of those same interests, whether it's again age or some life uh, event that they're dealing with, when they become closed or they refuse to allow new people in, that's when we begin to flip and click is when we are unwilling to allow new people into our group or we become unwilling to reach out to draw new people in. This is um, where, where these cliques form. And so one, I believe there's an education of what the difference of a common interest group is and a clique. And then secondly, as a leader is how do you break that up? How do you teach them? And I, I believe a lot of it is in the teaching of what those groups are about. And I think it's uh, page 230, the second paragraph it says, no matter how tight knit a small group might be, being tight knit is okay. True Christian community is willing to receive others, including those with social and cult cultural differences because of God's missional nature. And so I think that inclusiveness is important as we open up those groups. And so again, understanding uh, the difference in cliques and communities. And I'll leave this with this section with this. Authentic communities 
occur when relationships extend outward as means of a grace to the larger world. And so this heart of authentic community is when these groups, even if they are tight knit, can also reach out into the outside uh, world so that they're missional in what they're doing. They see that these groups can be more than self-serving. And so it's important. Um, there's a section following this that um, begins discussing virtual space. And, and we saw that through this pandemic more than ever before. It's how technology plays into um, discipleship and Christian education. Um, and it, it gives some good thought that is there. I think this is something that is evolving personally, um, such as through this crisis of um, COVID in, in 2020 that we have faced and, of course, still to this day are dealing with. We saw that many of us had to move to more virtual space. And so um, it, it's, it's something that is developing. But I do agree um, with uh, some principles that are covered in page 232. Number one states, Technology should be an extension of rather than a replacement for human activity. Um, it is a tool. Uh, technology is a tool. There are some cases in our church that we have people that is their only engagement uh, with us, whether they're by distance too far to physically come on our campus or uh, work schedules or things of that nature. But really, at the end of the day, we want to build authentic relationship with people um, beyond technology. Technology is a tool. Now, that is something probably arguable in today's culture. And, and um, but, but I would personally still argue that human interaction is God's design. And if it is merely through a screen, we lack um, authentic relationship, at least at the depths that God created. I, I would state that it is a tool uh, and we need to understand where that tool fits into our body. So for me, I understand it's a tool, um, even in the initial days of us having to go strictly to a virtual measure, it was a tool to bridge us from where we had been to where we're going. And, and today, when we have on-campus activity in our church, uh, we use virtual as a way to connect with people in a um, safe, um, comfortable way that may not require them to come to our campus, um, but it is not the entire package. It is a tool. It is an extension of our ministry. It is not a replacement of our ministry. Um, moving into the next chapter, and um, we'll take a few minutes really to cover this uh, chapter 16, Congregational Context and Small Groups. Um, this um, for me personally, has been a phenomenal chapter, and it's one, I hate to say it's been one of my favorite, but um, it, it really is because I think it's extremely important where we sit today. Um, all of our contexts are a little different where we serve, the communities we serve, the church history, and where it is in the life of its vision. All of those things are different, but in the areas I've served, and I haven't served around the world, but I have seen that this is an area that is struggling, and I, I would say, and this is um, I'll say it this way. This is just Josh's opinion on some of these matters is we have saw in particularly the Western culture uh, with social media, the social media technology and just the move, what we would often take the, say the entertainment or, or the show. Uh, I have called it before a Sunday morning. We see it broadcast in social media. We see it broadcast um, on TVs. And it's all about the large gathering. And those things are good. We obviously, Sunday worship for us, as we call it, or whatever in your context you call that main gathering of worship and the word being preached and taught to you, that's a vital part. But we have kind of glorified that to the point that every other element has become secondary. And there is this primary event that occurs where lots of people come and it's where we get all of our attention as pastors and we see this just um, exploding and, and often we end up seeing a lot of pastors in mega churches becoming star statuses because it is the beginning and end. This chapter really dives into an element uh, that we miss as we talk about everything in discipleship, we get into what we perceive sometimes as an old school mindset and a new school mindset. And I think it covers it very well uh, in Sunday school and small groups being those contexts. Um, Sunday school, it covers in, in detail of the theology of Sunday school, the strategies. Um, and then it goes into the elements of small groups. The chapter ends with a list of questions that um, I think are great. Now, I wish again we could gather and spend a lot of time in dialogue but, but it says this in the 
final pages of 247, Sunday school and small group. And it begins to view them kind of in a back and forth, what Sunday school was, what we saw uh, the small group movement as. Uh, and even states uh, midway into uh, page 247, some experts say that congregations cannot have successful small groups and Sunday school classes at the same time because of busy schedules and too much variety. And then it leaves us with these questions um, to ask. And, and maybe there's some other questions that you could ask, but these are great starters. What are the primary purposes of small groups or Sunday school? Are Sunday school classes designed to be small groups that foster community or larger teaching classes? Can traditional Sunday school classes and small groups coexist and be successful? Are adult classes organized by age st stages and development, or do they include all ages? And if your congregation has an effective Sunday school ministry program, do you need to hold small groups or Bible studies during the week? Um, and so here's here's my kind of few minute take on this. Um, one is I don't think one or the other is right or wrong. Every one of our church cultures and contexts are different. Um, often we have looked again, speaking into the world I know that a, uh, a church is viewed as cutting edge or new or vibrant or whatever other words you may want to associate into a modern culture uh, church environment if it has small groups and it is old or traditional uh, in a, a Sunday school. And, and I would argue that what bo uh, both of those elements are covered in, in the text that we've read is the importance of both not necessarily coexisting, but that both have value and what that value is. And I would encourage you to ask your church leadership, if you are serving in leadership, um, depending on what you have, what is the purpose of Sunday school or what is the purpose of small groups? What is its goal? And, and again, several of these areas are covered in, in the writing that we look at. And, and so look into that. And some of your churches may have a wonderful Sunday school program that is working very well for you. And so I would encourage you um, that you keep doing that. You may need to clarify its purpose. You may need to continue to teach that purpose. And um, as you look into the pages that that cover Sunday school and in those areas, that you may look and make sure you have all of the elements that it speaks of to make successful Sunday school work, work in your environment. Um, but look into what you're doing and why you're doing it and make sure those that are teaching or leading those classes understand all of those things. And flip side is do not do small groups because it is the new thing. In fact, um, as one seminar I went to one time, a pastor said, we do not have a Sunday school on Sunday morning, but we have it every day of the week. We just call it small groups. And so um, depending on your church structure, they may actually be one and the same. It just may be the meeting times, places, spaces, or the reason that they come around. What is the objective of that? Um, this is a personal opinion again of mine, but um, a lot of churches I have seen that had dying Sunday schools, they changed from doing Sunday school because they said it doesn't work anymore here. And that may be true, but before you um, throw it out, I would encourage you to go back and really evaluate what you're doing. Um, you may have to rebirth it. You may even rebirth it under uh, a more trendy word of small groups, but ask what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I, I bet a lot of times that you um, will learn from it. And so here's one of my takes from that. Uh, while Sunday school has a uh, biblical uh, meaning to teach, to train, to educate, to raise up disciples, the heart of what we're trying to encompass, um, I have found many dying Sunday schools existed because we had oftentimes even a great biblical teacher but we were just spitting out tons of information and we were getting deep in the text. And we have people that, number one, are being taught at a level they don't understand. Number two, they're disconnected, sitting in a lecture setting where there's no relationship. And every way I personally have read uh, Blevins and Maddox talk about Sunday school or small groups, both of them have this element of community or relationship with each other equally to our relationship with the Word and to God. Because it is in that small group setting, whether it's a Sunday school or a um, small group, actual small group, that relationships form and it's the dialogue. Whether it is still a teacher that is teaching or it is a group discussion, the, the holistic and, and organic nature of the community, whether it's in a classroom or in a home, of them having relationship. And so um, it, is, it is my theory 
that many of the small groups, if not to some degree all, uh, excuse me, Sunday schools that have, quote, died and churches have stopped is because they become an information sharing center and not a relational center. Um, we, in our church organization, we have wonderful Sunday school curriculum, we call it, and, and it's phenomenal information. But if you teach every piece of information in that lesson, you're probably going to bore your students to death. Um, there's more information than an hour or 45 minutes for certain can actually share unless you just read it. And oftentimes I've said in Sunday school classes that a teacher, um, number one, may have not been well prepared. So they literally just read it uh, page by page, paragraph by paragraph, or maybe have the class read it and simply say, what do you think about that? And that was the beginning and end. Or they were so studied on it, they could talk about that lesson for hours and there would be no engagement. Um, uh, I believe that in a Sunday school or a small group setting, that relationship becomes a foundational priority to the point that there will be times in a healthy group, whether Sunday school or small group or whatever title you call it, but when you have small numbers, uh, that eight to 20 or whatever it is, and you really are building community, you're going to have some times where whatever you had planned, the book, the lesson, the subject matter will not even be shared, or if it's shared, it will be very minimum. Why? Because the relationship with each other trumps every other piece of conversation. And so that's my take. One of the things I think we're missing. And so um, the old line, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. I've served in one church specifically, maybe more than that. If I was to really be honest, that had done away with Sunday school simply because they forgot why they were doing it and um, instead had to rebirth. And often I have saw them lose spiritual maturity as a congregation because they lost it and they did not know what to replace it. Uh, a great mentor in my life often said uh, that often we remove things creating a vacuum and if we do not quickly fill it, someone else will fill it. And usually that means the church, the body of Christ has lost out. And in this case, when we see Sunday school just stripped away um, without a replacement or clarity of why we're doing it, we actually create a vacuum and a void that will be filled by something else. And if not by the church and the principles of discipleship, something else will fill it um, and we will lose their spiritual maturity, which may, uh, affects our overall church dynamic. And so um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this chapter. I think it's phenomenal. I wish that we could take uh, more in-depth time with it because I think many of our churches are facing this. We, we know how to do Sunday morning well uh, in a lot of our churches, great worship and great preaching, but how do we engage in these group dynamics to create the, the conversations, to create the engagement? Um, I, I think this chapter covers so, so much um, and, and begins to address some areas. And so I, I encourage you, whether you're doing Sunday school, whether you're doing small groups, whether you're doing both, um, make sure that relationships, this is again, just me personally, relationships are not lost in that and that they stay open, not clicks, but they stay open that new people can join in uh, and realize that this is a community of believers as in the book of Acts where they gathered daily. It's these smaller settings, um, whether it was my childhood, that was my Sunday school class that stayed in contact with me, helped me accountable, encouraged me, or if it's my small group today, those dynamics seem to be fairly consistent no matter whose model you look at. Both Blovins and Maddox speak of that relational dynamic being important uh, and, and that accountability occurring inside of that. And so uh, understand its purpose. So one final question I will leave with you that uh, feel free beyond the, um, the assignments this week is where do you think the role of Sunday school and small groups are in your church? Um, is both of those existent? I would like to hear that just personally. Um, what's the purpose of those if both of those are? Or is um, Sunday school an actual small group that is kind of under the wing of, of small groups? And so knowing how your church does that, and, and again, the key word is what's its purpose? What is the purpose of those small groups? Uh, are there multiple purposes and they have different identities? Um, or, or is there an overarching identity for all small groups? So I uh, hope that this uh, lecture has been engaging with you. Um, I've tried to keep it brief. Thank you. Continue to email me if you have questions. Um, you're doing great. We're nearing the end, and this is getting really into the trenches of what you're doing, what your church is doing, and forming your mind and your heart of what you would do in face of new questions regarding uh, specific to, again, Blevins and Maddox Sunday School, 
uh, small groups and the overall identity of communities inside your congregation. So God bless you. I uh, pray God helps you and you grow and learn in this journey as much as I am.